Welcome to the Real Chili Podcast. And the Golden Eagles of Marquette University in Milwaukee are bound for the Final Four for only the third time ever. Five seconds left. Marquette down by one. Trying to avoid the upset. Blew the drive. The left hand. It's good. Every day, as basketball players, as students, and I want to win every day, most importantly, as people. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Real Chili Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lavender. I'm here with Eric Pond. Eric, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing great. Celebrate so, a good Butler win. Celebrate a great Butler win. We might as well call this the Cloud Nine Podcast. The we're gonna overreact and think and talk about how excellent this team is for the entire podcast. Marquette for the first time since 1990. What is that? That's almost 30 years ago. Marquette won at Hinkle Fieldhouse against Butler, a 76-58 win. Eric, I. There's so much we're going to go into with this game, but I don't know if there's anything else to call this game than a statement win for Marquette. Absolutely. Uh, I know it's been well reported. And as you said, Mike, I mean, first time winning at Hinkle since I was two years old. I think <laughs> you, uh, I, I, was about to, yeah. I think I was about to turn to, I think it might've been one and yeah, it's just unbelievable. I think it's also the worst beat Butler suffered at home since losing to UNC in 92. And I think that's a year in which uh, the Tar Heels ended up winning the national championship game. Right. Butler does not get beat at home like they got beat by Marquette this week. It's a big time win. And it is a, as you said, it's really, uh, really a reputation making game for us. And more than anything, that is awesome. That's, I mean, it really puts an exclamation point on this team going into a bye weekend halfway through the Big East season, and I am jacked. Yeah, it is a lot to be excited about. One of the things that was so evident to me early in the game was that we were controlling the pace. And I think the number of teams that can control pace in college basketball is relatively short. But I think the number of teams that can control the pace on the road, particularly at a place like Hinkle, dude, that place was packed. And by the end of the game, that crowd had filtered out with like four minutes left to go. I, I think we're going to get into it and get into you know uh, some of the minutia of the game and, and the flow of the game. Um, but from a, a big picture standpoint, this is a game that if you're a Marquette fan, in your confidence level coming out of that game, at least mine, uh, is a lot higher and and we're going to get into it so let's not get ahead of ourselves but I think this has implications for March but Eric I think at the beginning of this game I don't know if you can remember because it was it mm-hmm. felt like a lifetime ago mm-hmm. but at the beginning of the game it was an ugly start the teams oh. were missing everything I think it was maybe you know 12 points combined in the first 10 minutes yeah, to actually pretty poor start um, to, to think about how we ended the game and then look back at like the first, um, what, three or five minutes. It was actually kind of atrocious. I think we had eight possessions uh, with nothing doing, nothing to yep. show for it. I think of those eight, five were turnovers and three were missed field goals. That's bad. And then Marcus really filled that team star, team leader role in breaking the bad run with the two, then a nice three. Uh, then I think Anum, uh, who to me, uh, I think I said this on the text chain, is one of my favorite Marquette players of the last couple of years. Yeah. It, just a guy who sort of seems to do it all when you need him to. Great steal uh, and then a breakaway layup to make it, I think, 13 mm-hmm. 9. And he re- like Anum really showed a lot about halfway through the first half. He then had another really pretty drive with a great finish at the rim um, showing that uh, skill where he can cut uh, and give us a different look uh, maybe than, you know, we're seeing on the perimeter with a lot of our shooters, but yeah, to your point, really bad start, really weird start. Um, Looking back on it, it feels like a lifetime ago, especially when we went up 20 in the second half Mm -hmm. to look back at how we started the game. But so I I think it was really a combination of Sakar and Marcus in the first half. Marcus uh, finished the game with 32 points. Uh, but in the first half, he had 19. And really towards the tail end of that first half, 
he was just pouring it on. He had a crazy kind of locked in the corner, uh, mm-hmm. three pointer, uh, consistently doing what we expect of him. He's averaging just right around 24 points a game, I think, right now. So he 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 surpassed what we would expect from him in a half by delivering 19. But without Marcus, if you take Marcus out of the equation just in the first half, Sam Hauser had four points, Sakar had seven, and Ed Morrow had four. And that's it. So really Marcus was, you know, this we've come to expect it to a certain degree, but really Marcus was our offense in the first half. And without him, uh, we would have been in a much deeper hole on the road. It's weird to look at uh, last year, just sort of trying to mirror uh, a little bit the stats or compare them or juxtapose them from our 94-83 loss at Hinkle last year, yeah. a game which I was at. Sam scored 30 in that game on 39 minutes of play. I mean, he really looked great. Uh, the game wasn't a total blowout, total loss, but I mean, we did lose by 11. Marcus only had 14 in that game. Mm-hmm. It's funny, one year later, you look at how much Marcus has stepped into that alpha dog role, just how he's making these shots. Almost, it feels like at every single position in the court, you know, he's driving with success. He's hitting those sort of long twos that nobody uh, nobody wants anybody to take anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and like his step back at the three-point line is so pretty and virtually automatic. It's strange to expect those things this year of him and to when he does it, you know, say yes, 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 when in years past or really virtually with anybody other and with any other player on any other roster, um, save maybe, you know, two or three players in the entire college basketball landscape, that would be a no, 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 yes right. shot if it goes in. Right. Uh, it's crazy. You know, Marcus – um, is doing it with consistency. He's doing it with volume. And he seems to be doing it from every sort of level on the court, uh, whether he's up on the rim um, in those long twos or past the three-point line. So if the story of the first half is is a slow start and Marcus Howard lighting on fire to eventually give us 19 points by the end of the first half, Marquette entered halftime with a nine-point lead, 34 to 25. Mm-hmm. And almost off the bat in the second half, I started to get a little tense because I was like, "Uh oh, this, this this has the makings. This has the feel of maybe Marquette shriveling from the moment and Butler making a run here." Uh, Marquette was in serious foul trouble. I think there was one point; it was right around the six, under sixteen minute uh, or the sixteen minute TV timeout in the second half. Marcus, Sam, and Joey all had three fouls, mm-hmm. and so they were on the bench and, and Wojo was rotating them in and out. And so we were experimenting with some lineups that aren't necessarily our most, <laughs> uh, our most high powered offensive lineups. But I think within that we saw Wojo say, all right, Joey, you're going to play with three fouls down the stretch here. We're going to give you the ball and we're going to try to run the offense through you. It was an interesting experiment. I think this was one of the first times we've really seen it for a somewhat extended period of time. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, I like what I see. Joey's got, you know, he's got the skills. He's got the capability to be, as a freshman, the guy out there. Um, And that was one of the big stories for me in the second half. Just, you know, the foul trouble and then seeing Joey be able to fill that role, even in a limited fashion. Absolutely. 100% right. You know, that's how I saw uh, periods of that second half as well. Running the offense through Joey for stretches it was so promising. There was a possession where he was banging down low, back down a defender, and then had a gorgeous like hook to finish towards the rim. It was just so beautiful. And I think it's, you know, while we're living in the present and we have big expectations for this team that I know uh, we're going to talk to, um, the future is so bright. I mean, and Joey showed so much of that in this game. He's doing it now. He can contribute now. I think this game showed a lot that our offense is diversifying. Mm-hmm. I think Joey, with more confidence, um, with more periods and stretches in games, maybe in the back half of this Big East season, can really gain confidence in some of those situations and then be such a huge asset for us going into the Big East tournament and then you know, doubly so in the NCAA tournament. 
Well, your point about diversification, like they were mentioning it on the broadcast and, you know, that's when you know it's gotten so obvious that everybody sees it. But it really is true. When you go with certain lineups, there are, at least offensively speaking, everyone can be a weapon. Sakar can be a weapon, Sam, Marcus, Theo, um, even Ed Morrow in spots. I mean, it's I don't remember a time like that in, in, in my fandom of Marquette. And just to be able to think that, there's not someone who's going to get the ball and can't do anything with it. There's potential everywhere. I mean, obviously that gives headaches to defense, but it's so special to watch. We're a deep team. I mean, and for so many previous eras, we have seemed to have been a pretty top heavy, Mm -hmm. you know, team in terms of roster construction, in terms of just depth. I don't know if that goes to recruiting or if that goes to specific, you know, scenarios in which, that's unavoidable for the coach. But I mean, we are deep, even Chartouni, you know, at a three to really help pull us away with like 13 minutes left. If you remember, I think the CBS broadcast cut off his shot and we yeah, they had a bad angle. That yeah. We couldn't one even, switch three. Couldn't even see it. Um, yeah. Either way, a huge sequence for him. I think that was coming off a steal by Chartouni really felt like he delivered when we needed him in that moment. And we can go down the line. As you said, Sakar has been so great. Obviously, the Housers, Marcus, Ed Morrow uh, came up um, at certain points in that game early on. Uh, I can remember a basket or two. Mm -hmm. Uh, Theo John, again, big blocks. You know, he can be trusted, I think, more and more on the offensive end as well. It's awesome to see a team with depth from freshmen to upperclassmen as well, where we're sort of well striated in year to year talent. And that's how you beat a team you haven't beaten in a location in 30 years like yeah. it's and not just beat them dominate them and i think you know with this diversification it's not like there haven't been some casualties i, th- I think as the lineup continues to solidify obviously there are different options that we can plug in there but as the lineup continues to solidify one person that uh has had diminishing and diminishing minutes uh, i don't believe even saw the court at all in this game uh, was jamal kane and obviously, Matt Held is someone who, who comes in situationally when he's needed. But Jamal Kane has been one person that hasn't yet been able to carve out a role. We'll see if that changes. I'm sure he'll be needed at some point this year. But really, it's kind of become Marcus, Sam, Sakar, Joey, and Theo with Ed, Chartouni, and Bailey rotating in at certain spots. And that's proven to be pretty good. And, and I think we'll continue to be that way. We would be remiss, though, if we didn't mention – the defense all of last year, all of the previous year, this is the third year of the real chili podcast. The entire time we've been talking about the need for defensive improvement. And we're not going to sit here and claim that this Butler team was the, was a Butler team of years past, right? This isn't the same caliber of team, but I think you made a point that this isn't the same caliber Marquette team. We're at a different level. The Mm -hmm. defense that Theo and Ed can bring on a relatively consistent basis I mean, we held Butler to 25 points in the first half and 33 points in the second half. Held them to under 60 points overall. That is a recipe for winning. Yes, it was a bad night for Butler, but Marquette's defense had a huge thing to do with that. Again, a really simplistic way to look at it. It's hard to say because, again, this is not the same Butler team as in years past, but it's not that much worse than the Butler team of years past. I know they're now, what, three and five in conference play, something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were only, they were 13 and six when we met them at Hinkle last year. And we let them score 94 points on us this (laughs) this year, 58. Yeah. Uh, Again, really simple translation uh, year over year, but uh, that says a lot. And we're passing the eye test as well. As you said, we have competent bigs, defense first players. You know, another thing that just seems to be, a little bit different about this team and maybe it's just the maturation of some guys you know who've been on the roster year over year but it seems to be the whole team team's identity that we have a lot of intensity we're, yeah. not, we're not letting up when we have the lead we're tenacious and dogged and we don't get complacent uh, I think I think it's even more unbelievable that you know we we've seen that as well when we're down we don't let up intensity we don't 
you know, sort of get lazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the Butler game uh, alone, I think we scored on seven or eight straight possessions with like 3.55 in the game or four minutes left in the game to pull 20 points away. We were not going to let that game slip out. And that's just sustained, sustained effort across the team from the top of the roster all the way uh, to the bottom. And again, we've been saying this a lot lately, and I don't think we can say it enough. A lot of this should be attributed to Wojo Mm -hmm. and his staff and just how great a job they seem to be doing with this squad in motivating them game after game, situation after situation, winning or losing. And that is so much fun to watch. We are not a team who's giving up. Like that is the most fun type of basketball team to watch. You're exactly right. There was a point in the second half here. We were up by 20, you know, between 10 and 20 for most of the second half, which I fucking love being able to say that. Oh, yeah. We we had a 17-point lead, about a 17-point lead, and Butler went on, I think it was an 11-0 run in the second half, Mm -hmm. and that place got loud. Those people were on their feet. They were ready to go. No panic. There may have been a few too many turnovers for my taste, but this team responds, and you're right. They just seem to keep coming at you, keep coming at you, keep coming at you. And they're like, it's just so fucking consistent. And these kids are, you know, 22, 21 years old. It's so amazing. And so with the context of this win, Eric, if if we're going to take a step back and look a little bit bigger picture, we are now halfway through the Big East season. We are eight and one in the Big East. We are second behind Villanova, a number of big games coming up. Mm -hmm. But you were saying just before we hopped on that we have now – surpassed I think with this win I would be comfortable saying that we have now surpassed my expectations for how I thought we would perform just in the regular season no question this was such a big time win uh, it puts the excla- exclamation point on sort of the first half of the Big East season for us I think we're at eight Big East wins in a row which mm-hmm. I believe I heard somewhere is the only the second time we've ever done that I think the first being maybe in the 10, 11, 11, 12 season, something, something around there. Anyway, uh, this is our best stretch of wins and sustained success under Wojo. It's one of the best success, you know, strings of success and wins we've had in our entire uh, Big East history. Uh, well, look it, at, put it, put, we could even put it this way if you're just looking at it. Mm-hmm. So we have only lost once since Thanksgiving. Only once since Thanksgiving. (laughs) And it's February, folks. It's February. That, I mean, so yes, eight games, but if you just want to say one loss, I mean, that is probably one of the best records. I I, I don't know, but we got to be up there with one of the best records like that uh, in all of college basketball. It's really, for how the season started, it's pretty astounding. Uh, Yeah. And and what? We were a dog going into Butler, right? Is that right? Yeah, it was, I think, our fourth time this year being a dog, and it ended up around plus three and a half. So you'd have to assume, I mean, come Monday morning, like, uh, and, you know, a lot of it we know is dependent on losses by the nine teams ahead of us. But, you know, we should rise again in the ranks. I think the rest of the season, we look at it, we know Nova on National Marquette Day. Yeah. It's going to be a hell of a game, a hell of a fight. Uh, we better uh, we better be getting to bed early before that one. Uh, <laughs> next four. I mean, what's our ceiling now? Is it a two seed? Is it a? Th- uh, it, I, I'd say three is realistic. I'd say four we're thrilled with. I mean, but what is the ceiling on this team? And you know, looking beyond that, even if we don't find ourselves in the Sweet Sixteen, is that actually a letdown? Like that's incredible to consider. Consider, yeah. If you go back and listen to our preseason pods, if you read anything written by anybody on this team prior to uh, October, that's wild to think. But we're in the situation now where that actually might be a letdown in some strange way. I, we're, I, good. we're good. Like that's bottom line. Like this team is really, really good. I keep waiting for the letdown moment. I keep waiting for the game to come where. I'm like, I can point to it and say, oh, there's the real team. That, that's them. They're not in, mm-hmm. And it just hasn't happened yet. And so the confidence is growing. You know, we've seen Marquette seeded as high as a three seed now uh, in, in some brackets. Expectations continue to grow, folks. I think I am at a point where if we, you know, barring a major injury or a significant collapse, if we don't make it 
at least to the Sweet 16, I would view that as a disappointment. I, I would – I mean, great season overall, huge strides made, yes. But with the way this team is playing to not get into the second weekend, that would be a disappointment. So, God, I hope we can get there. We're getting close. Halfway through the season. Yep. And, Mike, you and I, I think we're at the game together. Was it the Elite Eight game in Washington, D.C.? Oh, yeah, that's right. We went to the Miami game. Yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, this team – I don't know. Like I've seen both. This team passes the eye test. Like it, you know, that team was loaded with talent, obviously, and much, much different team. The identity was so much different, you know, really scrappy squad. They were the buzz squad that would just keep, keep coming at you, but in a different way. And like, they finally somehow put it together at the end. Pure buzz identity. Like, yeah. like to his core, he may never have another team that – listen, I know what he's doing now at Virginia Tech, but he may right. never have a team, again, that embodies his identity as much as that squad did. <laughs> right now, we're doing it without tricks, without gimmicks, without weird bullshit uh, stuff happening on the quarter at the end. And uh, listen, I am not discounting any of those players who played on that buzz team. We put some magical runs together. Yeah. This team passes the smell test in a much different way. Mm-hmm. I would be more confident betting on this team than I would on that squad. Like, and that's yeah, I don't know. That's crazy to me. We're comparing apples and oranges now, and we're getting into a pretty, uh, pretty gray space. So, cut me off. <laughs> All right, we're cutting it off, folks. <laughs> but I'll tell you what: there have never been a group of guys more excited about the the potential for Marquette basketball this season. We've got a few couple fun games coming up here, Eric. We've got mm-hmm. a. Uh, two-game homestand here. St. Mm-hmm. John's is coming uh, to Milwaukee on Tuesday, February 5th. Uh, and then, of course, the game that everybody has circled on their calendars, Villanova, the reigning national champions, visit Milwaukee Saturday, February 9th. It is going to be a 2.30 p.m. Eastern tip on Fox, on the big Fox. I really wish I could be in Milwaukee for this game. Not going to be able to uh, make it, but are you going too. up? Uh, I am not. I've thought about it. Um, I think the get-in price now is something like two hundred bucks, oh, which is shit. unbelievable. I just saw. Um, I just saw that on the the old Twitter machine um, yeah. today. I think, I, I, like that crowd better be. I mean, just jacked up. We know they're going to bring the intensity. National Marquette Day is always a big deal. Like, let's go, let's go, guys. Uh, Mike, uh, if you'll allow me, I just have a few Please. junk drawer items uh, at the end of the pod here, Love as the always. Junk drawer. We, this is this needs to be our first recurring segment. Yes, I, I think the you know the junk drawer is necessary. So I believe I saw that Marquette was in danger of not sending any NBA players to the All Star game for the first time since two thousand four, which is really come on, an, Dwayne. That's a really an unbelievable run of individual success by MUBB alum, if you think about it. But just today, Dwayne Wade was announced, along with Dirk Nowitzki, as special additions to the All-Star roster. So I think we got one more year uh, on that. To wow. uh, I think the run continues. The run um, continues. So we, yeah. we got to get Jimmy back in there. I was, well, Jimmy or, hey, who knows, maybe Marcus makes it next year, you know? Ooh. Oh, shoot. Not hey, don't year. go there. Not no. Yeah. On on that note, another junk drawer item uh, in the realm of recruiting. Uh, if Marcus does make it next year, um, Samir Torrance has been crushing his high school competition. That's right. We would hope he would reclassify. But in case you didn't see, he went out for 39 points with 10 boards and nine assists the other night, which is like, what what the hell even is that? That's unbelievable. <laughs> um, so let's get jacked up for uh, future classes as well coming in. Let's have sustained success here. Sustained competitive excellence is what we're about at the uh, at the Real Chili Pot. I think we got to have a pot at some point about maybe a little recruiting, maybe a little future future uh, roster stuff. Because you're right, there's a lot to be excited about next year and in future years. This the future looks bright. It certainly does. Put your put your sunglasses on. <laughs> All right, folks, that's going to do it for us uh, here on the Real Chili Podcast. A lot of fun stuff coming up. As always, thanks again for tuning into us your MUBB podcast signing off for Eric Pond and for all the fellows who eh, sometimes put in work here on the Real Chili Podcast Eh, once in a while. while. I'm your host, Mike Lavender. We'll talk to you next time.